Good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I serve as executive director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's resident talk. Thank you for joining us to learn about and help welcome five of the more than 50 practitioners who will work and stay at Sitka between now and April. Sitka is located at Cascade Head on the North Central Oregon coast and resides on the unceded traditional lands of the indigenous people now represented by the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. There's so much to learn. Just one way that we invite you to do that, especially if you're visiting Sitka or this region, uh, we encourage you to visit the Chichalu Museum and Cultural Center, which is just a 25 minute drive from here and such a vibrant place. And I'll, okay, and then we'll, uh, move on with the, uh, the program. Sitara Arashlu was born in Tehran and is a multidisciplinary artist who is interested in the intersections of art and social, political, and environmental movements. She graduated with an MFA in studio art from Queens College and an advanced certificate in critical social practice from Social Practice Queens. She has worked as a museum and art educator in different institutions, such as the Museum of Modern Art Queens College and Empire State College SUNY. Her collaborative and individual works have been exhibited internationally in the US, Iran, Afghanistan, France, Germany, and Australia. But tonight she is with us here at Sitka. So wherever you are, I promise we can hear you. So please make some noise and help welcome Satara Arashlu to the Oregon coast and to Sitka. Thank you, Alison. Um, so I'm going to share some past work and some of the works that I've been working on um, at Sitka. And uh, just kind of tell you a little bit about my practice and, and what I'm doing here. As a, a multimedia artist, I uh, work with in different mediums and, and, and with, with different materials and I kind of pick and choose my material or, or media as the process goes and sort of the work unravels itself but I can um, um, say that there is like a my work has a strong foundation in observation drawing and engaging people and environment uh, around me. I have a uh, strong faith and I kind of mean, I exactly mean faith because it has saved me from being confused or, or just feeling of loss in, in observational drawing. And a lot of times uh, my work start from there, although I rarely uh, share those as, as final works and they usually feed into uh, the works that I'm making. So these are some Older paintings, ink on paper. Uh, the this is a uh, these are the series of work that I uh, painted right after moving to the U.S. after years of drawing from Tehran and um, kind of as a practice of understanding myself and my body in this in this space and uh, it's sort of translated into these memories then and these uh, paintings um, and um, as I uh, went forward and uh, with the MFA at Queens College I was able to study with a lot of professors from social practice Queens and that helped me uh, think deep dig deeper and and realize more of my practice uh, link in an in, in engagement with social issues and things that uh, move me. And uh, that sort of um, expanded my areas of practice and, 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 and projects that I uh, worked about. Um, and it sort of added this uh, phase of research uh, into my practice, which um, I, I talk about a little more in, in, in this body of work, which um, started with uh, researching uh, sort of um, inspirations that has 
uh, been with me in, in art making and studio practice. And I went back to these, um, I would call them, I, I, I named them prison souvenirs. These are um, prison crafts made by um, mostly former political prisoners. And I'd seen a lot of them growing up uh, in, in, in my house and uh, friend's house. And they always were these like mysterious, beautifully made uh, objects in, in many different formats and um, in sort of tracing the kind of uh, inspirations that uh, feed into my studio practice. I, I, I went back to them and started documenting uh, where I could find them. And if I could talk to people who own them or people who made them, I started interviewing them and collecting the information about their process, their uh, intentions and, and and what these objects mean uh, to them, and it's and it's it means a lot more um, than the objects. And um, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, there's like uh, appropriating materials to be able to create something, and then use these as a sort of a vehicle that sends message in 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 under restrictions that sending out words can be very tricky. And uh, these become a sort of a way to communicate with the outside, with the dear ones, even among the prisoners. Um, and it um, creates uh, a way um, that they connect it to each other and uh, skill sharing and um, creating tools to be able to make these works. And um, I just have always been fascinated by these objects. Um, I love history and I um, am fascinated by personal accounts of historical events as opposed to sort of master narratives. And I, um, these like little stories about how these objects were made in a specific time, a specific um, historical time uh, sort of allowed me to dig deeper into these um, personal stories of, of these people, um, which kind of then informed uh, many of the projects that came after that, one of which was this series of um, animations and, and, and performances that I made based on three of the stories um, that I collected during these interviews. And uh, this one is about uh, how uh, one of the people I was interviewing, he was in prison and his wife was in prison. And I will read you this short story that uh, she gave me. Uh, my wife was supposed to give birth on August 18th. It was October and I had no idea what had happened. I received a package from home, uh, searched it thoroughly for a hope for some news. I didn't find anything and the day was over. I was disappointed and tried to sleep, but it was cold. I went back to the package and wear the, wanting to wear the jacket they, uh, that my wife had needed and sent to me. Uh, and as I uh, put my hand into the sleeves, my fingertip touched um, the seams and a tiny note jumped out. And I read, you've got a son. Mom and son are both healthy. And uh, this like, I, I you know, chose moments of these stories and, and reenacted gestures from them and then animated the gestures. Um, um, which is a process that helped me. Like it, it, it's, it, it's. Um, I had to redraw a, a very slightly changing um, gesture, and it's sort of dissecting the moment and um, and uh, then starting to manipulate it to get to the core of the story through uh, through these gestures. Um, if we have time later, I'll show you the animation. And then uh, I use this as, as performances where for performances where I projected the, the animations onto a screen and thinking about how the screen functions as, as something that reflects the image 
uh, it shows things and it hides things and and uh, there is like a presence of it that affects how how we see the a screen and wanting to kind of um, explore that idea. So with a with a collaborator, uh, performer, and musician, we worked on this uh, project where we were showing the animations, um, projecting them on the screen, and then behind the screen we were standing, embroidering, you know, like stitching into the screens and kind of. Uh, distorting the image and and, and uh, as the viewer was watching it, it was accompanied by a score that she wrote that was a translation uh, of these stories into Morse codes, and then uh, she reperformed them with um, with Belzik. And uh, hopefully, I'll have time to uh, play that for you. And and if not, they're all available on my website if anyone wants to go back and, and and see them and listen to them and these as i said it's it, this is like a long journey to these stories where they become something else they become sort of um present in my life and a, a kind of a new vocabulary uh, that i then started to play with in this this is like a series of uh photos um i took it's called your place is green and it sort of captures the passage of time and brings these these gestures into my daily life. Um, another work that I am showing you here is uh, the is a book. It's uh, it's a picture essay, more like a, a, a graphic novel uh, that uh, is called Body Over the City. And uh, it talks about a series of individual protests um, in Iran, by mostly by women, um, against compulsory wearing of hijab, uh, where they stand it on usually some of these like elect electric uh, utility box and, and uh, take off their hijab and usually made a kind of a flag for it. That and, and it, they suggested a sort of um, a performative form of uh, objecting something that was very different than what uh, I knew of, uh, of this kind of um, street protests. They're individual. It's uh, the least interruptive for the flow of the public space. It doesn't interrupt anything. It sort of stands above and just uh, make a suggestion of 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 a of an image of an imagination that was so long uh sort of omitted from the face of of that city and and so in this in this book i'm talking to another performance artist and bringing in notes and 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 sort of reminders from the history uh of iran and um, in kind of looking more closely into these um, series of uh, protests. Um, and as for the project I'm working on at Sitka, um, I'm making a series of prints uh, from these drawings I made uh, from my grandmother, um, kind of capturing and documenting, uh, cap capturing her, the um, progression of uh, her dementia. They started as uh, just like me spending time with her and uh, being able to spend time with her physically after 10 years and kind of be part of her daily life. And um, it's uh, and this urge of trying to um, uh, fight for forgetting that gesture, that light, that mundane moments of uh, repeating daily uh, tasks. Uh, a lot of times she's knitting, reading newspaper, trying to make sense of present against a sort of uh, disappearing past. And our conversations, I take notes of our conversations and, and, and the textuals and visual notes sort of combine and it uh, it's then encouraged me to uh, translate them into a prints where the marks are engraved and and there's like another layer of mark making and uh, I'm hoping to be able to print them on 
uh, fabric and, and, and add embroidery on top of them. Um, this, I was, as I was preparing for this, uh, I, I went through the, these drawings and I found this, the first one I drew from her, where she makes this cynical joke about herself. Uh, she's asking me, what are you doing? I'm telling her, I'm drawing you. And she said, why, where you were, there were no monkeys to draw. And I'm like, as I'm laughing, I feel sad. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then it's sort of, as, as we talked and then talking to other friends and uh, collaborating with another friend who was also doing some work from her uh, my grandmother, I started thinking about this sort of um, hostility towards uh, aging body just at, in the society and, and that affects people's mind and they and as like older uh as they get as people get older it's harder for them to see the beauty of, of aging body um and that sort of uh was i i decided to put and and uh, put her in public space and sort of um rebel against that hostility and uh let me see if I can play this one. So, uh, so um, part of this work are these animations, like that I can project into different spaces, like this one. So this one is just right out outside of my studio here at Sitka, and I was playing in uh, with like projecting the this like short animation into uh, onto different surfaces and, 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 and bringing it to here. Um, let me see. And then I, as, as I go, I think about sequence and duration and, and, and uh, different ways of uh, putting the drawings together and how that sort of adds another layer of Mean, meaning and narrative to them. So like animation and then different ways that the images can have, um, can create a sequence together, like these accordion uh, notebook that I have here, I think I'm out of time. So I'm just gonna go, these are uh, the dry point prints. Um, did I make here at the studio? Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Satara. Uh, you were just speaking some to uh, how your uh, the the work you're focusing on during your residency. There's a, a question in the Q and A if you want to type a more uh, a direct answer to. But thank you so much for sharing your work. So Nick Campbell is a musician and sound artist working to design sonic experiences that expand the concept of how music can be created and enjoyed, particularly in relation to nature. Campbell uses organic and unique materials, occasionally along with mechanized and interactive elements to create musically pleasing experiences that welcome listeners to be a part of the music and disappear into it if they choose. Based in Bend, Oregon, Campbell's musical career has included sound art experiences presented at galleries and events across the country, as well as music created for award-winning films. As a member of various musical groups, he has toured the country with artists including Band of Horses, The Indigo Girls, Derek Trucks, and others. His most recent sound art explorations have been centered around the Arbo, an instrument created from a living tree to produce music. Campbell's most recent film score was nominated for the Roger Taylor Award and the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema this year. So please make some noise of your own and help us welcome Nick Campbell to Sitka. So yeah, first, th thank you for that introduction. And thank you too to Nicola and, and Tamara. Uh, yeah, I'm really <clears throat> very grateful for this experience here at Sitka. So uh, thank you for everything you all have done. Um, it's awesome to see what Satara is doing and can't wait to see everyone else's work too. It's fun to see what, what others are, uh, yeah, working on while they're here. So, um, yeah, I'll just sort of, uh, walk through, uh, <clears throat> what led me to this moment, uh, you know, here at Sitka and then talk about a little bit about what I'm doing. So, um, I'll share my screen and sort of start with a bit of, uh, 
bit of history here. So here, this is, uh, you know, I started playing in bands. Uh, that's me with, with uh, Amy Ray from the Indigo Girls. Did a few tours with her, uh, with my band, Arizona. Um, <clears throat> that's what you're seeing, correct? You're, you're, me with another musician, cool, great. When I had long hair and all that. Anyway, so that was, uh, you know, my, my beginning, uh, just touring the country, playing shows. And this was my next band, M moved to Los Angeles. I'd started back east in New York and North Carolina and ended up out in LA playing more music. Um, but uh, initially, my, my change from like, when and to this day, I still record albums and pl play with other musicians and things of that nature. But um, somewhere along the way, working in the music industry, I, I, I just ha had almost like an instinctual feeling that it was just way, way overinflated. You know, there's a 10,000 bands, everyone's battling for someone to pay attention to them. So <laughs> In a way, uh, my, my first walk away from uh, traditional music was almost born out of the uh, desire just to do something that in, uh, a seemingly infinite number of other people weren't already doing. So, you know, I started thinking about what really inspired me in art and what drove me to try to express myself through music. And, you know, what, while my passion's always been centered, like, in music and melody and con composition, like... Um, I was always really inspired by installation artwork and like the, the, where that really started was actually with a, an installation I stumbled into is maybe a 17 year old, I think of a Billy, Bill Viola. Um, and he, he's a wonderful video artist and it really changed my life. And I, 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 for whatever reason, I started meditating on what is that that he did that was special. And I recommend everyone go check out his work. I, I am no authority on, uh, you know, gallery art or video art in general, but his work was really meaningful to me at that time in my life. Um, and, and so I started to really think, is there a way for me to take what I find beautiful and valuable about sort of gallery and conceptual art and start to tie that into like, like normal music composition? And that's where it sort of started. So the first thing I did was I just uh, tried, there's this weirdo art gallery in Los Angeles called Machine Project, which unfortunately is no longer, but um, I just dropped him an email and said, hey, I've got this weird idea. Can, can we talk about it? And it was this idea based around a song I'd written called Pull Through, where I'd like play guitar with strings. Um, <laughs> to sort of, and then I had the, like, it was very all over the place. It was my first time doing something in a gallery. I was just sort of was throwing stuff at the wall. So I'll, I'll play this quick video. I don't know how it's going to come across. Also, let me know if you actually hear the audio. I try, I'm trying to hook up my audio. <laughs> So I'll sort of fast forward that I might talk in this video. <laughs> yeah, I've got Sam playing one guitar. Which I still want to do more of that. These guitars played with my name is Nick Campbell and I did a project called Pull Through here at Machine Project. Uh, these ongoing uh, you know, sort of like slow chord progressions that would change over time played by a machine video. Um, and then along with that, I wrote an electronic that, um, composition to be sort of central to the whole thing, since that's where it came from, so the, the idea initially. And then I had one guitar with uh, two motors that I played manually, not with the Arduino. And so there were just buttons that I could hit that would turn the motors on, and each motor played a different chord on a guitar. Um, and then I played another guitar just with a paintbrush. Um, created like, uh, anyway. That was just the first idea. It was like sort of like, okay, let's see what I can do in an art gallery. Again, it was sort of all over the place, did a bunch of stuff. But um, you know, thankfully they filmed uh, sort of the creation of it for me, and some people saw it and started to lead down this path where other people reached out and said, "Hey, do you want to do this?" And it, uh, I started to expand uh, sort of what I could do there. Eventually, you know, sort of the next stopping point on this, I did a few different things, but I'll just sort of fast forward. Um, I, I expanded on this idea of playing guitars with sand. So, um, uh, you know, I, eventually I want to get like a, a full room of, of instruments like this that you could do like a hyper complex composition. But basically, I, I um, you know, I'll, I'll, I did this. Uh, this was an installation that sat for a month, but it could also be performed by people who just walked in there. But I also uh, did a performance like with my band at the time played a song with it. So the thing that, like what I'm doing here is, um, I'm pressing this trigger.
uh, whoops, and if I, well, but move on to the next project, the Arbo. So this is, um, this is when I really started to incorporate nature specifically, and, and I'll connect where this came from in a second, but uh, basically the idea here um, was uh, to, I had this thought of like playing, and you know, you, you, now granted, I'm still using extractive technologies. Like I'm very aware of like the hypocrisy of what I'm about to say, <laughs> but um, just sort of been a part of being human at this point. But um, you know, we tear down trees to make pianos or guitars or whatever. You know, you destroy the elements of the instruments. It's like, well, hang on a minute. The tree itself is resonant. What if you could go set up your instrument the tree, play it? Like a storm, the wind picked up, carried us a song. Of what is to come, we're here to tell you. very hard to play so i'll be honest that fi the final take in the music is not a single take it's hey hey nick just a, a heads up where when you play the videos we're mostly hearing the video and it's hard to hear oh. what you are saying at the yeah, same yeah, sorry i don't have much no, no worries okay so yeah and i'm sort of blabbing on top of it what i was just trying to say about the trees was um i don't know if you picked up what i said about just sort of symbolically the idea being that um you know, instead of destroying a tree to make an instrument, you could, you know, use it to play music in a way that, that um, yeah, that you can use the tree, work with it and move on. It lives its life and it lives yours. You live yours. So um, anyway, I'll sort of stop there. You've seen the, the various projects that, that have at least in some way led me up, uh, led up to now. I've also, you know, done various uh, film and commercial projects, you know, um, I, I don't know, I, I won't, that now but that was that's also really inspired how i approach music was just working with other mediums um and uh so yes yeah, so that brings me you know just fast forward up to up to right now at sitka and and what um you know the, this project with the arbo was really part of this too but i think i've really deepened my my understanding of what i want to try to get out of this and it's the idea of um creation in place it's actually always been like really important to me you know i even in recording records you know it usually happens in moments you you know even if a record takes two years to finish there's you know usually a uh, a period at the beginning where you sit down and get a chunk of work done and i just have like a very strong personal belief in the power of place um and how much place and setting can inspire work so in sort of like owning that um more and more with projects, I've um, developed this idea that I shouldn't compose until I'm in that place, that, that composition, it, you know, and that doesn't mean I'm not, I'm, I'm always writing little ideas and stuff, but like, um, you know, like here for Sitka, I came here with an open mind, not quite sure what I was gonna do. Um, purposefully to see what the area would, would bring to me. So I had some preconceived ideas of what might happen, but you know, then nothing ends up happening the way you think. And so, you know, right now I have four compositions that have been inspired, two songs from the beach here and two from Cascade Head. Um, you know, I, I might build it into more, but I wanted to share some of what I'm doing currently. Um, I think I'll start with something that's a little bit more, um, yeah, this is, this is a film I was seeing the show and I almost shut this. That's, that's why there's people pointing guns at each other there. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll play an idea first that came. So, so like, for example, how, how do I do this? So like the first, you know, my first full day here, I got in a kayak, went across to the beach. A absolutely beautiful. Um, but, you know, went with, with my phone to film and went with, you know, uh, my, some sound equipment uh, to sort of explore like what's going to, what in this environment is going to inspire a piece of music or like what could be musical. And the first thing I, I came upon, which was actually pretty far down the beach, but I started to see all this bull kelp. And uh, it's like, interesting, it's, you know, tubular. It looks like it could maybe make a sound, you know, most of it's soggy and terrible feeling. But <laughs> every now and then there's a piece that has, is like fairly rigid that actually would make a beautiful tone. So I, um, so what you're gonna see here is very rough. All the music I'm gonna play for you now, I, I beg for your forgiveness. We're looking at my work in, uh, you know, if this were a painting, this would be where you're still scratching, sketching with a pencil. So just keep that in mind. Mix is undone, sound might be chaotic. Um, but this is, uh, you know, 
why you'll see me play live what I did on the bulk help on the beach. And then you'll hear the beginnings of a composition of like what that's going to you turn into. And, you know, I was like, Very simple idea, just showing at the loosest, you know, electronic drums in place of where I'll, you know, overdub real drums and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, so, you know, this rhythm just sort of felt right on this bulk help. I, you know, bring it in, loop it and start to add to it. I've also, you know, my, my last, uh, you know, sometimes things that I do are a little like acoustic based, other times more electronic. For some reason this time I've been really um, something about what I I'm doing here is drawing me towards uh, synthesizers. So, <laughs> so I think this is going to be a more electronic project. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to show like another example of um, how this plays out and you actually let you see sort of what the process looks like a little bit. Um, let me know if any of this is too loud or not loud enough. Uh, so I wanted to show you first. So I went up on the Cascade Head on a, on a windy and rainy day and there are these, you know, all these little beautiful streams filling up with water. And so like, you know, this is one of them. Um, you know, I got, I got a nice little filming of this nice little world here with water falling. You can see some water dripping off the leaves, and that, that'll be important in a second. Let's see. So, this is just my phone filming it. Um, but also at the same time, you know, I had my little audio rig there picking up sound. So, um, and what, what I did is, you know, I assumed there were. You know, when I recorded the water, there was going to be some patterns. It would be interesting. Like that was, you know, you just, you, you know, it's going to be there somewhere. So, you know, then I sit through, you know, and I can actually just show real quick for the fun of it, you know, like my, um, you know, you can, you can see all the, the audio and <laughs> video, you know, it's just like, I just capture it and sit here in the evenings and just go, you know, go through it, which is sort of fun. Um, yeah, yeah just look for things. So in this one, I'll, I'll play the audio sample here. Okay, so that last thing we just heard, it might be hard to hear. I heard a little pattern in there. Um, it's right here. I'm not even sure what it was. I think it was water dropping on the microphone because there was water falling off the trees above. There's also a little click in there that could even be digital noise. I genuinely don't know, but it created this really cool pattern. Well, let's hear it again. And, and then I, I looped it, so it creates rhythm. So they that for a second. And the cool thing is it's both a, a rhythm, doom, 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 doom. Doom, 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 but it had a slight melody in it. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I got a rhythm and a melody. I'll take it. And then I started to think, well, okay, but it's sort of hard to hear that melody. So what, you know, what pulls it together? So what I love is this is an area where the hillside and the beach came together. I was like, well, the bulk help would be perfect for this. So um, the cool thing about the bulk help is you can cut it at different sections and you'll get a different tuning on the tube. So, you know, I brought some back to the studio. They're rotting outside the studio and I need to throw them away. But <laughs> Um, uh, the, these are before they rotted, uh, after I cut them up and tuned them. So you'll be able to hear the same melody here. So that's, you know, now when you put those together, it pulls out the melody and the rhythm a little bit more. So, you know, the, so, so now we have a background thing. So then that, that becomes the loop that I start writing on top of. I'll just let this play for a second. You can hear where I'm with it.
right. So anyway, that's the uh, that's the idea there. Um, uh, you know, I've built it out into a full composition, but we, you know, like I said, it's all, all in progress right now. Um, so I, that, that's sort of it. You know, like I said, I've got, you know, four individual pieces of music I'm working on now. Oh, I guess one other thing, I actually am using the Arbo here too. Um, you, you know, so I, I, I strung up a tree out front here. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been recording that the last two days and filming it as well. I won't, I, you know, whatever, they, they, I won't go into that now, but I'm, I'm also bringing in that sort of concept um, because I really do love the idea of like connecting with a specific tree in the area that I'm working in. I think it's sort of a fun thing that, that feels meaningful. Anyway, uh, th that, you know, I, I know it's probably time to move on to the next person. So that, I think that sort of encapsulates, uh, you know, A, how I got here and B, what I'm doing while I'm here. And, and to that question that, that, uh, that was asked, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to come here and work at Sitka is like, um, for the kind of thing that I'm doing, it's, uh, it requires something like this. So like this space, it literally, I, I couldn't be doing this without it. So I, I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity and it will allow this next piece of work to exist. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And uh, sort of taking us inside work in progress. It's always fun to see things that don't quite have a bow tied up. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, I'm, thank yeah, you so much. I'm down to share. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I'll have you uh, mute your mic. Great. And um, uh, so Rukmini Kalamachi uh, was going to present next, but was called away at the last minute. She's actually working on a book project while in residence at Sitka and an interview that uh, she has been uh, waiting to come through, just came through uh, today. Uh, so we're uh, uh, sad that she's not with us. She sends her uh, well wishes and regrets. I thought I would go ahead and read uh, her bio just to take you a bit inside her work and to just honor her presence as part of this cohort in spirit. So Rukmini Kalamachi began covering terrorism in, nine, in 2013 when locals in the city of Timbuktu, Mali, led her to the building that had served as the headquarters of Al-Qaeda's North African branch. On the floor and in overturned cabinets, she found thousands of pages of internal Al-Qaeda documents providing a window into the terror group's operations. A three-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, Kalamachi spent uh, seven years in West Africa for the Associated Press before joining the New York Times in 2014. In addition to the Pulitzer citation, her series, The Al-Qaeda Papers, won the Michael Kelly Award, as well as two Overseas Press Club Awards. Her reporting on how Al-Qaeda and ISIS were bankrolling their operations through the ransoms paid by European governments to free their captured citizens won the George Polk Award and Society of Professional Journalists Sigma Delta Chi Award for Excellence in Journalism. In 2016, she was awarded the inaugural Integrity in Journalism Prize by the International Center for Journalists for her coverage of ISIS's theology of rape and their enslavement of Yadazi women. Just on a, a personal note, a few years ago, we were reflecting at Sitka uh, on the residency program and thinking about people whose work takes them to the front lines of natural and social unrest and injustice. And uh, we were actually talking about journalists uh, in particular and what it might look like to serve them through our residency program. So we're just thrilled that uh, Rukmini is uh, here and um, uh, excited to learn from her about how best to support working journalists with residencies in the future. So uh, she sends her greetings and Tress will look and see if we can find a time to reschedule her to share uh, more of her story and her work with you. And we'll uh, also post a link, I think if we can, um, to her uh, uh, website so you can just learn more about her. Okay. Chino Chung is a queer and trans Chinese Mexican creative nonfiction writer and grassroots activist and is currently working on a collection of short stories that integrate his social activism with his intersectional identities. He is an MFA graduate of the California College of Arts and is currently pursuing his uh, Master of Arts degree at San Francisco State University. His work appears in Gender Queer, Voices from Beyond the Sexual Binary, our Family Coalition newsletter, and he is editor of the Asian Pacific Islander Transgender Anthology. Chino lives in Oakland, right behind, uh, between the Latinx district and uh, Fruitvale and Chinatown. Welcome Chino Chung to Sitka. 
Hi, thank you very much, Allison. And I just really wanted to thank Sitka and the Sitka staff for all your generous and lovely um, help. And um, I've just really enjoyed my time here. This is my first residency, so I feel very privileged and honored to be here with um, all these other just brilliant residents. And I'm up in the just a lovely, wonderful 80 acre um, uh, Oregon grassland um, meadow that I wake up to every morning and just look down on the meadow and see the elks, the herds of elks laying there and grazing on the grass. It's just amazing. And I'm a really early riser, so I get up at 4 or 5 a.m. <laughs> and I find myself in the office. There's this beautiful office on the second floor that just overlooks the meadow. And I'll just sit there and wait until the, um, the sky starts turning gray and lightening up. And I'll just look and see if I see any um, elks laying down. And, um, you know, I just feel like I've I don't know, formed a bond with them or something. You know, I, I went out the other day and there was a female and a male elk and I walked outside. They were only about 20 feet from me. And the female elk was making this sound, which and just stood there and they didn't run or or anything. And they it was kind of like a whining almost. And I just stood there and just listened and um I mean, I could go on and on, but one morning, and you know, I mean, this is like my life for the past week. Um, one morning I woke up and there was a mother and a baby elk in the meadow and the mother started cleaning the baby and cleaning inside the baby's ears. And it was just an amazing thing to see. So um, it's just been a beautiful place for me to, um, to meditate and to write and um, I'll talk about two stories I'm working on now. Um, one of them, which I've been working on more lately, is about my father's death. Um, and it's called Trail of Ashes. He died last April, six months ago. He was 95 years old. And um, I went to Fernandina Beach where my brother brought him. It was his hometown. And um, after he passed away, I do a lot of walking. After he passed away, I was walking on a trail and, um, you know, I was, I just had a lot on my mind and, you know, just grieving and feeling very sad. And um, the trail turned into this um, huge trail that just had this fine powdery sand that it seems like the, maybe the ATVs um, we're going over, maybe just over and over and over, and it was just fine like ashes. And um, that's where I got the title from, Trail of Ashes. Um, and I've been sitting up in the office overlooking the meadow and just um, writing the story and just feeling the grief and the sadness. And it's been, you know, I feel like, um, this 80 acres is just holding me and allowing me to have all these feelings while I write, um, you know, the sad story of my father's passing. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about that and I don't want to get everybody sad, but um, I've also been working on another story called Bodies and it's a story I've been working on for a while and I'm, I'm just now finishing it up and I've, I've spent the first probably three days at Sitka finishing up because I'm going to submit it um, to the Hopkins um, writing folio, which is, and it's due on November 30th. So I'm finishing that up and it's, you know, I'm a social awareness writer and I write about social awareness issues. And this um, particular story called Bodies is a very um, embodied piece where I took a lot of notes during the first um, few months of COVID-19 and shelter in place. And it's about that time. And um, that time was a, that first three or four months was a tragic and turbulent time and um, also a transformative time. And I just really tried to capture these huge universal um, issues that were happening at the time, you know, COVID-19 and the pandemic but also George Floyd and the protests. And there were 
um, riots and protests that were happening in Oakland. And um, I captured that. And as, as well as um, climate change, there was a series of fires that happened also. There were the three complex fires. And we were talking about that. We had a potluck last um, weekend, um, the residents, and we were talking about the fires down there and up here in Oregon. And it was just so, it was like California was on fire. Um, it was just a, you know, and in Oakland, I just, there was so much smoke and ashes were floating down, you know, onto the cars and onto the ground. Um, so I, I wrote about all these things from a personal point of view. And in that, in that way, I was able to take these huge things that were happening and making, and writing about them personally makes them more, more universal makes it more um, relatable to, um, to individuals and to people. Um, so that was my, you know, that was my whole, um, what I was trying to do. So um, I also write about being trans and, um, you know, that it kind of starts out that way. And in 2020, I've, I've had top surgery and in 2020, I hadn't had it before. Or I hadn't had it yet. And um, I write a lot about this thing that happened to me a lot. Um, and I, I called it the full body scan, where when people questioned my gender, especially other men, they would um, sometimes they would um, scan my body and their eyes would land on my chest. And um, before I had top surgery, I, you know, that was really hard for me. And, um, you know, I felt at the when that would happen, I felt like I had nowhere to go or no other way to be. And um, so I was really happy and fortunate to be able to have top surgery through Kaiser. Um, and that was a whole experience itself. But um, but I, I said that because I'm, I'm going to read a, um, a scene from, from my story, Bodies. Um, and it's when I first started walking, it's a, it's a story about walking through history, through everything that was happening at the time. And so this is when my first walk in shelter in place. And um, so I'm gonna read this scene. At first, I walked through my East Oakland neighborhood, past the gazebo where Luna and her gender fluid court practiced cumbia for a quinceanera, past the gray intersection where neighborhood boys screeched out sideshows that spun dark circles in the worn asphalt, past parked cars that lined both sides of the street, bumper to bumper to the top of the hill. Before COVID, groups of Vietnamese, Cambodian, and African-American la African -American ladies walked around the park with extra long sun visors or jeweled sunglasses, talking and laughing, and Latinx men would play soccer on the short plastic grass, yell for goals and slap each other on the back. I'd wake up in the morning listening to the music of the park and try to catch the rhythms of the languages with subtle tones of words and laughter and the timbre of the bird melodies with the big insistent crows, high pitched warblers and the occasional woodpecker rat-a-tat tatting for termites. But now, I stood at the top of the hill and looked down the long battered street at the old sunrise market. The only sound came from a lone man on the corner who scuffed the toe of his rubber sole on the rough cement of the sidewalk. He wore a trucker style hat that sat high atop his head and his dark hands were stuffed loosely in his pockets. The corner store was a dingy peach color. Heavy black bars covered the two front windows and thick brown cardboard sat behind the glass. A red sign hung outside that said, the census benefits our families and communities in block white letters. The air had that silent, empty feeling. I didn't see a bus sign and I wondered why the man was there. If he waited for the store to open, he'd be there a long time. As I got closer, he looked up and saw that I watched him. I could tell by the way he started to turn away but then cocked his head with his chin pointed towards me just a little. I nodded to him as I got closer, that definitive downward nod I learned long ago, the confident one that says, I see you, I get you, 
I acknowledge you. I used my deep voice. How you doing, man? I said. And I was surprised he answered back and didn't just nod because he seemed so immersed in his private world. Good, good. What about yourself? He had a strong baritone voice. Normally, I would make my greeting and walk on, but I was drawn to his rich masculine voice, so I stopped, unscrewed the top off my water bottle, and took a quick swig. Oh, just taking a walk, you know. I tipped the bottle up to him. It's my first time out since shelter in place. He nodded his head up and down slowly and looked straight ahead. Mm -hmm. I walk every day, keeps my blood pressure down and the sunshine's good for my constitution. He patted his round belly and it sounded like bare feet slapping on wet concrete. He took his time with his words. I pursed my lips together and nodded in agreement. It's true, he said. Blood pressure's gone down from 180 to 160, all without medication. Six, eagle, <clears throat> six seagulls flew overhead in a V pattern, four on one side and two on the other. Wah, 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 they caught, they caught loudly. And when he looked up, his face spread open and smoothed out as he watched them glide towards the bay. I like this guy who took pleasure in watching the birds fly in the wide open sky. I have a lot of respect for that, doing what it takes to stay healthy, I said. I patted my own belly and it sounded like a flat drum. I'm trying to do a little bit of exercising myself, but I have to take it easy because I get competitive. No one out here to get competitive with, he spread his arms open. I laughed. I mean with myself when I work out, I push myself until I get injured. That's not gonna happen this time. I let out a half laugh, a short breath of air pushed from the top of my stomach. That laugh at yourself kind, that's halfway between a scoff and embarrassment. Well, I hope not anyways. I hurried to cover my embarrassment. I'll try to take it at a slow pace. Don't push myself. Like you said, it's just me with myself. Really, I'm just trying to figure out how to stay safe and walking alone is the one thing that seems safe to do with COVID-19. He raised his eyebrows and his hat and ears went up at the same time. Oh, I don't know about any of that. I don't believe none of what they tell us anyways. I had heard about people who thought COVID was a government hoax or God's way of punishing us. It reminded me of the AIDS and HIV epidemic in the 80s. I wondered what he thought, but I didn't want to ask questions, so I kept talking. Well, it seems safe if we stay six feet apart, but the thing I don't believe is what they're saying about masks, that, it, that it's riskier to wear them. I think they just want to save them for themselves. I crossed my arms in front of my chest and looked at him out of the corner of my eye. I wanted to say something about Trump and his fake news, but you never knew who was a Trump supporter. He, st he stood still for a moment and I waited. He grabbed the brim of his hat, took it off, put it back on, and then adjusted it up and down and side to side in quick little movements. When he finished, it was in the exact same place, high on his head. None of that's gonna matter anyway, he said. He snorted through his nose, a half laugh, half scoff. They aren't thinking of me or mine when they say any of that. Never have. Yep, I put my arms down and closed my mouth. More thoughts ran across my head, cradled to the grave, gunshots, sirens, bad air, Richmond refineries burning. He turned his head to look at me and we held each other's eyes for a long time. Then his eyes darted from my left to right eye like he was looking for something. My breath stopped and the back of my neck buzzed. His eyes moved down to my nose and then my lips. My binder squeezed my chest tight. I felt lightheaded. I couldn't catch my breath. He looked down to my chin and then my neck. I froze and waited for him to look down at my chest. His eyes flicked down to my flat Adam's apple. His bulged out in a full V shape. Then I saw his whole head move down. My chest sunk in and my head filled up with cotton balls. He looked at my chest and his eyes stayed there, blurry and unfocused. My head burned, sweat spread across my forehead, and my ears throbbed. 
I felt dazed like in a dream. A dog barked in the distance, an angry snarling bark and a plaintive whine. I swallowed and slid my hands in my pockets. He looked at me and spread his arms out with his, with his palms up. It's all in God's hand, hands, he said. God created all this and he'll keep us safe or it'll be your time. There's no need to worry about any of that. I let out a big breath. He didn't question my masculinity, but I had to be careful. He seemed like a nice guy, maybe even a grandfather, but I'd already let my guard down. But, it, but at this moment, the street was so quiet. And as I stood there looking at this man, this older African-American man who was close to my age and me, a transmasculine Chinese Mexican person who stood here on the same lonely street from the same neighborhood, who breathe the same air and risk the same things, our families, our safety, and our lives, with all the different and similar ways we expressed ourselves. It made me want to stand a little taller, straight my back, and hold my chest up. I looked right at him and said, you got that right. He looked right back at me and said, amen, brother. Thank you. Thank That's you, it. Gino, and thank you for uh, reading for us. Okay, we've got uh, two more residents to introduce you to tonight. Emily McIlroy was born and raised in Norman, Oklahoma with her twin brother, Ross. She received her BA in studio art from the University of Arizona in 2005 and her MFA in drawing and painting from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2011. She served many years as an instructor and art educator for the Honolulu Museum of uh, Art School and the Hawaii State Art Museum, and currently teaches in the drawing and painting program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. When she's not teaching or in her studio, Emily enjoys reading, writing, and walking and swimming her way through various terrestrial and aquatic wildernesses. She lives and works in Honolulu's Palolo Valley, but tonight she is here with us. So please help welcome Emily McIlroy to the Sitka Center. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, yeah, I'm so grateful to be here. I think we all have uh, certain threads that run through our lives from our childhood um, through middle age, and I haven't reached old age yet, but I imagine uh, to the end. And uh, two of those threads for me have been always art and ecology. So my inner child is just like all lit up to uh, be at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. So thanks for having me. Um, I was just going to do a, a kind of take people through um, just a really loose arc of my practice uh, since grad school. The project I'm working on here is very much under construction and not quite ready to share too much uh, from it, but um, uh, maybe in the future, but uh, kind of like Nick was saying, how did I get to this moment? Start here. So I'm just gonna start with uh, my, my thesis exhibition, which was in uh, 2011. Uh, which is called Between Two Waters. And um, Allison mentioned that in the bio that I grew up with a twin brother. And the, the kind of third um, thread through my life, I said the relationship to art and the relationship to the natural world and uh, kind of completing that triad was my relationship to my twin brother. Um, it's these kind of maybe three pillars of identity um, and when we were 24, he, um, he passed away very suddenly. He'd been suffering from mental illness for a long time, but um, his death was still quite sudden. And um, this was, I've always been a very curious person and asked a lot of questions. And I think this just, um, his death was the beginning of a, a series of questions that, um, that I've tried to process and explore and find some kind of answers through to through both art and through the natural world. Um, so a lot of this work is really looking, I would say both outward and inward. Um, I'm looking 
out to the energies and the forces of the natural world to see how those kind of mirror internal processes or internal energies. So this kind of first question of grad school was like, whoa, where am I? Um, my, my spirit felt very entwined with my twin. So if he's not here and I'm here, then I'm kind of left in this very liminal space. And this space reminded me a lot of being in the ocean. I do a lot of long distance swimming, swimming for miles in the water and surfing and kind of just watching um, the waves and the tides moving in and out and just being in this environment that's very unmoored from like everyday physics. You don't have the same kind of orientation that you have walking around on land. You can move up and down and side to side and um, the logic of it is just very different. Um, and this kind of dissolution of absolutisms or this kind of sense of being unmoored was um, a lot how I was feeling on the inside as well. Um, so I did two pieces, one that was kind of trying to locate myself in space, which was this one, and then the second, um, and these are very large, this piece is 13 feet tall, so this was kind of trying to locate myself in my body. Uh, the two waters being the waters of the world and the waters of the body. Um, and yeah, also thinking about, I don't know how many of you have spent a lot of time underwater, but everything, a lot of things under there kind of look like the inside of bodies because the ocean is almost like the blood. So you see these corals or these anemones and like everything feels very organ-like and um there's this feeling of like you go underwater and then the world's just been kind of flipped inside out, um, which was also how I was feeling um, in my own body. So I found a really kind of interesting parallel there. And these are just some detail images. These works are quite large, so it might be kind of hard to tell um, the surfaces. I work a lot very additively and subtractively. Uh, kind of mirroring that process of creation and destruction or that sense of being in the world and not being in the world, um, form coming into being and coming out of being. An installation shot here just for some scale. Sorry, that one's a little blurry. And then um, this second kind of question that I ended up in, um, this one was more, more of a crisis than a question. It was like, okay, I'm in this place and I'm not sure where I am and I can't really reconcile kind of straddling these two worlds. And I'm trying to hold all of these different things together at once in my psyche. And I did this residency in uh, Brush Creek Foundation for the Arts in uh, Saratoga, Wyoming. And there were these hummingbirds that would come to these feeders outside our studios. And um, progressively over the course of the month, there were more and more birds and they were getting more and more aggressive. And it was just really fascinating for me to watch these creatures that we put on uh, Hallmark cards or kind of think of as being really angelic and delicate take on this um, really rather violent um, posture towards one another. And I was like, oh, this is the question, like how can, um, how can something like my brother or myself or any of us be uh, these two things at once simultaneously? How can we be both fragile and graceful and beautiful and delicate and also, also ruthless and destructive um, and, and at times violent? So, um, this piece was trying to pictorialize all of those things happening um, at once. And it just this has the earlier piece and the hummingbird piece again for scale. And this was an installation at the Honolulu Museum of Art in 2015. I do work smaller sometimes, you can see a little one there, but uh, I like to kind of swim in the in the pieces. Um, and then shortly after that, that piece, uh, my mother also passed away really suddenly and I was kind of revisiting these, these questions that I've been having were taking on more and more urgency, I think on a spiritual level. Um, so I had moved from kind of where am I and 
okay, here I am, and there's all these polarized parts to this idea of who, you know, who am I, and who was my brother, and who was my mother, and who are any of us anyway, and I need some serious help, because the, the amount of tension that this is creating inside me is really getting to the level where, like, I can't hold all of it anymore, um, so I decided I was going to ask for help um, and make these prayers, uh, so these are my prayer paintings, and I, I started this with a trip. I usually, as you notice, most of these pieces have a connection to some environment um, or creature, and I went to uh, Alaska and the Yukon. I just um, wanted to go to the most wild, remote, rugged, raw place I could think of, in retrospect, I think that was because I just wanted a mirror for how I felt inside. And I just walked across the ice, um, walked across these glaciers and across the tundra and took a good look out at this frozen landscape and thought, wow, if this is what's going on inside, I'm in a lot of trouble because nothing's living here. It's pretty much just um, cold and ice. So I got back to the studio and uh, started started making these prayers and I had a mantra that I was um, saying each day in the studio as I was working on these there's um, an idea called japam which is if you repeat the name of God enough times that your heartbeat will actually sync with the universe um, it was kind of this answer to the question you know how do you pray without ceasing in the Bible? There's, um, I forget which passage it is because I'm, um, I don't know my Bible very well, but Paul, I think it's Paul says, pray without ceasing. And um, it's like, well, how do you do that? And there's actually an anonymous work of, um, by a Russian author that called The Way of the Pilgrim um, about this pilgrim who goes on that journey and is told, just keep repeating the name of God and you don't even have to believe in God and you don't even have to, um know what you're saying it doesn't matter it's just going to happen naturally so I thought all right well I'll give that a try um this is probably going to take about three to four years was kind of my internal timeline and so I um just went down and prayed and worked on these pieces for the next three and a half years and they, of course, transformed, as most things do in the creative process. They started out as these kind of monuments um, and then dissolved into um, a landscape that started out rather heavy and rather dark. And as I went through this process, things started breaking up. The ice started breaking up. More and more light started coming through these heavy areas. Um, and I could talk for a long time about these, but I won't, but in some, there's a lot of visual vocabulary that's been uh, folded in throughout the years that made it into these pieces. And I will comment briefly on the title of these, uh, the lilies, how they grow. Uh, the reference to that is also to a, to a Bible passage which is consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They do not toil or spin. And yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. And the reason that I was really holding on to this passage, and there are bits of lilies, um, you know, kind of dispersed, sometimes in pieces, sometimes um, more obviously through these nine, nine works. But I... I came to realize in the course of those uh, three and a half years that the question, who am I, was the wrong question. Um, I didn't find a who. I went as deep as I could and as far as I could, and whatever I turned up with, it was um, it was like grasping at straws or grasping at flower petals. They just kind of melted in my hands. And um, I heard that, vibe, that Bible verse um, when talking with a friend and I was like, oh, the question is how, you know, how am I? It's not consider the lilies of the field and who they are, it's how they are. So then the question uh, becomes, well, now how do I, how do I move through the world? Um, I've taken this frozen landscape and through prayer and through a lot of other processes that I won't go into, I've cleared up all this space and, um, now what can I bring through? And that's 
kind of where I landed at now with this project I'm working on. It's here at Sitka is an artist book. It's called the working title is The Hidden Meadow and the meadow really being that space where the lilies are and that space where um, you just kind of offer yourself to the universe and the external and the internal no longer is even a division. Uh, perhaps that dissolves and um, if I'm lucky, if I get to where I where I hope to get, you enter some kind of non-dual awareness where you're just in the field and then you die and then you're in the field again and then you die and maybe that's all the field. There's no life and death either, but um, that's where I'm at now. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for sharing your work. Okay, we've got one more presenter. Raina Schaefer is a tribal citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She was born and raised in Oregon, where she still resides with her husband. They have two children and three grandchildren who all live locally. Schaefer has been weaving traditional Cherokee double-walled baskets for over 20 years and was fortunate to have learned from a Cherokee elder. Weaving is Schaefer's connection to her ancestors and we are glad that she is now connected with Sitka. So please welcome Raina Schaefer to the Sitka Center. Hi everyone. Um, as Allison said, I was taught by an elder. Sorry, <laughs> I always get emotional thinking about it, but what I rarely share is that I was taught by an elder through a vision. And it was actually a vision that I ignored for several days until I got to the point where it was all I could think about. And I knew that I was supposed to be making baskets. So I got the material out again and gave it a shot and I made the basket and I never looked back. Um, I wanted to share with you guys kind of my process of how it all goes. So I use um, commercial read. And I don't, I don't feel bad about using commercial read at all. I firmly believe in supporting third world countries and their income to their families. Um, this, I take the bundles apart and I make piles on the floor. This is me dyeing it. I use a big, large water bath canner to dye my read in. Um, and then I cut the basket into whatever lengths, depending on what size basket I'm going to be creating. And I start with the traditional six over six spokes that I was taught. Um, then it gets broken off into twos and then I add extra spokes to help make the basket larger, which is uh, tedious and sometimes frustrating. You'll see there, you have to wrangle it into the water, which it likes to pop out often. And I will sit there fighting it, but I'll get it in there and I just let it sit and soak. Um, here's where if I'm getting ready to turn the basket, cause it literally is you weave up a basket and then you turn the top and you weave back down to make a double wall basket. So essentially you're making two baskets in one. Um, this, this is what it looks like when I've turned it and I've started weaving down the outer wall. And while I was at Sitka, what I really wanted to focus on was creating smaller baskets that you can just literally hold in your hands and incorporate encouraging words. I'm sorry. I lost my nephew to suicide in 2018. And with all the turmoil in the world, all I could think about was how I could maybe make somebody's day better or maybe encourage them. And so I created a body of work that has words of encouragement, whether you um, need something to focus on, 
or you want it for a meditative practice, they'll come up soon. Um, those are all the large baskets that I made while working there, which I appreciated having all that space. Um, this is the start of a small one. And it's the same process. You can see the little nippers. I set them there for comparison of scale. It doesn't matter how big the basket is. I always start with the six on six, what I was taught. And then I wrote um, words on pieces of leather and attached them to the baskets. There's, there's the pieces of leather. And I chose each one like the basket would call to what it was supposed to be, just in the hopes that it would maybe make somebody think and encourage them that there is light, even when you're in the darkness. Um, thank you. Weeping baskets has always been very spiritual to me. Um, it's very sacred. It is something from my people that I can continue to bring forth into the world. My parents were born and raised in uh, Oklahoma. My mom's people were considered old settlers who came out to Oklahoma before, well, to Indian Territory before the removal, um, my dad's people were on the trail of tears. And it's just, living in Oregon is great. I love it here. We, we call it God's country. Um, but I always felt disconnected from my tribe and my culture until the baskets. And that's what brings me back and it brings me to my people. And I know who I came from and the strength and the courage that they have given me and continue to give me as I know they're around me and they're supporting me and my family and watching out for all of us. So thank you and thank you Sitka. The time there was so beautiful and magical and I appreciated being able to share it with my husband. And I just, I can't thank anyone enough. I just really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raina. There's some comments coming in in the Q&A. I'll just read uh, this one. Thank you for sharing your experience so vulnerably. Your practice is so thoughtful and beautiful. Uh, and thanks everyone uh, for uh, sharing so vulnerably uh, this evening. It really was uh, a joy to step inside of all of your uh, work and experiences. And I'm, I'm uh, one of my favorite parts of these talks is, I'm sure we all hear different things, but just some of the different through lines or, or uh, resonances. Uh, there was something so lovely, Raina, about the words you're embedding in your baskets and the, uh, the note of encouragement tucked in the sleeve in the story that Satara uh, shared, you know, just little things like that. Um, uh, I, I just uh, love these talks for this reason. So thank you, Satara, Nick, Chino, Emily, and Reina for sharing your work. Good luck with your interview, uh, Rukmini. Thanks to my colleagues who work behind the scenes to support these talks and get the word out about them. And thanks everyone from the SICA community who tuned in tonight. We'll say good night to you now. Thank you so much, everyone. We look forward to seeing you back here again. Good evening. <laughs>